is the May 23rd meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. And as you all know, we are continuing to meet uh, virtually tonight. Um, I believe the governor's um, option for this is expiring in July. Am I wrong about that, Sarah? That's right. Mm -hmm. um, so at some point we need to have a conversation about uh, how we want to continue. And I don't know whether that will change um, just because the COVID situation doesn't seem to be going away. So. Um, that may get revised, um, but we'll see. But I think we will meet again in June virtually, and then we'll decide what we'll do after that. Um, that's good with everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's just so everybody knows, the meeting is being recorded, as we all know. Um, we always start these meetings for the general public to offer any comment that they have about any items that are not on the agenda. And it looks like we have a few members of the public here. Um, so if those individuals would like to speak, um, just if you could please give us your name and your address. Um, Janet, it looks like you were waving your hand. Nice okay. to see you again. It's been a long time. It has indeed. I'm Janet Gross and live at 38 Round Hill Road. And I'm here tonight to make a comment about 88 Crescent Street. While pursuing real estate ads last March, I noticed a photo of 88 Crescent, both a house and an address I had never encountered. A realtor from Coldwell Banker provided several documents detailing the dwelling's history. And I soon learned the house whose origins date back to the 18th century and that originally stood on Round Hill Road near Bancroft was once a gymnasium for the Round Hill School for Boys one of many innovations Coswell and Bancroft brought from Germany to Northampton in 1823. Later, the gymnasium was extended to a length of 60 feet as it morphed into a bowling alley for the Round Hill Water Cure and Hotel. Next, purchased by Lucy and Dawson, who owned 76 Crescent, it was moved to its current locale, probably by Oxen, about 1890, where it served as a carriage house and stable. The heavy stone wall currently in front of the structure and its brick facade were added at the time, apparently to provide necessary stability. After Dawson's death, Edward and Chase Woodhouse purchased and renovated the structure to create a single family home. Woodhouse, by the way, um, served as mayor of Northampton in the 1920s. For the next 40 years, it was owned and rented multiple times, often by Smith faculty. In 1967, William von Boris and his wife purchased the house. Jacqueline was an excellent historian whose published history of Northampton is well worth reading, as is her comprehensive and detailed history of 88 Crescent. Yes, there have been multiple, multiple changes but the structure's history juxtaposed to the 2016 burning of Clark's Rogers Hall, once home to the Round Hill School for Boys and later to the Water Cure and Hotel, makes a compelling argument that 88 Crescent is worthy of a Form B and an on-site plaque attesting to its long association with some of Northampton's most important history. I've spoken with the prospective owner and he is amenable to a plaque. Consequently, I urge the Historical Commission to become familiar with the property and its past, to be followed by appropriate action, ensuring that its significant history, integral to that of Northampton's, not be forgotten. And yes, I'm willing to send you the documents about the house and provide any assistance you may require. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. That's um, fascinating. And you continue to be the Round Hill historian, and we appreciate that so much. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. And all the information you've gathered over the years that I've known you, I'm sure it goes back further than that, um, is all of great value to us. And yes, please provide the documents. Um, I also imagine that the Forbes Library would want those as well. And um, it's Apropos that you're speaking about this tonight because we're starting to, in our planning process, 
um, think about the inventory of historic resources in the town. And we're gonna be talking about that later in the meeting. Some of our um, consultants are here to help us with that. So um, please do that. And then we'll consider the um, plaque effort um, as we move along. Excellent. And I don't know why there's no form B, but, or if you're even in charge of that. Well, yes, that's part of our charge. And um, it's something that we need to work on. And we know that. And that's partly why we're doing this planning process to identify those holes in um, the inventory that need to be plugged. And so your research is going to be great and just, you know, getting that for furthering, furthering all of that. And as well, but any other research that you've done um, that you're willing to share with us would be great. Because I know that it's excellent research. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. Any other commissioners want to comment? Dylan, I don't know anybody. I don't want to take up all the room. Anybody? No? I, I, I do just want to say, I, I think um, the um, age of this building, I mean, I know you said it was moved in the late, well, it's clearly, you know, it's before 1900, obviously, when it was built and then when it was moved. So it would, it, it is in some way, if, if it would come before us in the case of an application for demolition permit, even without a Form B, but we certainly do want to make sure that we fill gaps of Form B. But the, the thing is a Form B can really help us if some question about a building or a, a, an area comes before us. So it will be really good to get a Form B so it's really there for, the, for now and the future. So thanks, Janet. You're welcome. I want to mention also that I was in that house the day that Janet was there and talked to Janet. And it was, a, it was a massive fixer, but it's still at some, I believe, old well over list price. And I believe that they're going to make it into a two family, which means that there will be some uh, conversations with the neighbors because the parking there is very, very limited, at least the way it's currently configured. They probably would have to make some uh, massive changes there to the layout accommodate more parking, but uh, just stay, stay in tune on that one. We're going to hear more about it as it gets through the It's actually already gone through the planning process. Uh, so they're converting a, uh, a, a uh, detached area to a, another unit. So an ADU, a dwelling, an accessory dwelling unit? I, I believe so, yeah. They've, they've already seen quite, received quite a bit of approval for that. Okay. Any other comments? I think, oh, yeah, I think yeah. approval for both a second dwelling and a new garage. Um, I would be concerned they will have to come back for approval for this um, old structure. And I have heard that they want to um, take down the brick which was why I mentioned that the brick was put up in 1890, presumably because they were concerned about um, stability. So it sounds like there's a layering of history in that building, quite a layering of history. Yes. Yes. And so the you know, decisions have to be made about what's the most important to preserve. Um, so, okay. Other comments? All right, are there other members of the public who had something they would like to offer to us tonight other than what's on our agenda? Okay, then we will proceed. Um, we do have a, a very brief, um, very brief chair's report because we met very recently. So there's not a lot to update. Um, one is that you probably remember and uh, were Reminded, if you review the minutes for tonight, um, back from November, that we had reviewed an application for the demolition of the Smith College Admissions Building, um, which is outside the historic district, national, the local historic district, but um, is an old building of quite a bit of significance. And um, I checked in with Sarah about this. We don't know. Um, 
if anything uh, additional has happened with that, but we do know that the demolition delay will expire in July. So um, July one actually is the date. Of July twenty first. July first. July first. Okay, so that's soon. Um, I just wanted to alert people to that, and it's you know quite a loss. We did what we could. If that if they are indeed going through with it. Um, the second is we have a couple of roof replacements in the district, local historic district. And one of them, I'm sure if any of you drive west on Route 9, um, I'm just looking around. I know Craig does. Um, that the roof is um, on the Seventh-day Adventist Church is progressing. <laughs> and um, it's quite uh, visible at the moment. So you should check it out. It's quite different from what was there, um, but I'd be interested to, as a, that was a project that we really did a lot of discussing about as everyone remembers. And it was hard for us to come to a decision about that, knowing how um, well these people, uh, how much they tried to save this building. Um, it could have been a big loss to the local historic district. So it was a bit of a compromise for us. So I'd be interested when it's done to have a kind of recap on that to see how we did. Um, because we yeah, are did. a meeting of the mind. I, I did notice that this morning. I was, now I can't remember why I was driving there, but yeah, I did notice that it was a lot of it was done. And you know, it obviously does look very different, but at least so far, I was pleased with the fact that it definitely doesn't seem reflective. I mean, it really seemed like a matte finish. And I don't know if the sun was, I mean, it was sunny this morning, but I, so I don't know if that's gonna be the case uh, every day, you know, when it's sunny, but. Um, I was pleasantly surprised, and I, I did notice that this morning. Yeah, and also it does have texture to it, which in some ways I think is mm -hmm. better than what was there before, which was really yeah. flat. Mm -hmm. um, so it will provide a little punctuation. Um, the other roof that was replaced, uh, it got slipped in without us knowing it was um, the Ottoman, and it seemed like they replaced that roof really quickly. The old Ottoman, it's been the Ellery for a few years. Um, and I think there was just a miscommunication about that. But as I said to Sarah, I think the new roof actually looks a little better than the old one, in my opinion. So it's very similar. But. Um, and then, but, go ahead. Does anybody have a question? I, I, I was going to say, you're aware that Smith College now owns that building. Are, are you aware of that? Yes, Sarah mentioned that to me. I don't know the details of it. Do you, anybody else know the details of it? Uh, uh, Craig, could you repeat that? I couldn't understand you. $3.3 billion. Because I, I think Smith had been using it to house um, students in isolation during COVID. Oh, really? Now they're obviously doing some sort of renovations. They want to use it to maybe, to maybe house um, families that come for uh, graduation or something like that. I, I don't know if they really um, have final, you know, I don't know if it'll be open to the public as a hotel still or not. Oh, okay. You know, I, because I still get emails from the community, but I um, I think that's all they said. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, and then just finally, um, we have uh, a couple of guests here tonight who are gonna be working with us later on in the agenda from uh, our consultants who are working on the preservation plan. This is exciting, we're getting started. So um, we'll, I'll hold off on any more on that until we um, move to it on the agenda. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes. And we have one set from November 29th. I hope all of you have had a chance to look at this and um, if anybody has um, the will, you could make a motion to approve. I'd entertain that. So moved. Second, anybody? I'll second. second. Okay. Um, any discussion about this? From what I recall, they look good. It was a long time ago. <laughs> It was a long time ago, yeah. <laughs> and our memories are getting feebler and feebler, feebler by the day, right? Mm. Um, okay, great. So uh, if, all, if that's the case, no more comment. Um, Sarah, we'll do a vote. All right, Barbara? Yes. Craig? Yes. Steve? Yes. Dylan? 
Yes. Martha? Yes. And Harvey? Yes. All right, unanimous, thank you. All right, the next one in the agenda is um, this working session that we have scheduled um, with our consulting team for the preservation plan. And um, as you probably all remember, we announced that the Barrett Planning Group based in Hingham is leading this. And we have with us, I believe, two members of the team. Um, Kathy and Carly, do you want to introduce yourselves? And Sure. Uh, well, thank you very much for adding us to the agenda. My name is Kathy Groomer. Um, I'm really pleased to be working with the Barrett Planning Group on the development of the, of the city of Northampton's historic preservation plan. I'm an architectural historian and a preservation planner. And over the last 35 years, I've been working in Massachusetts with uh, cities and towns on their historic properties inventories, their national register nominations, and a wide range of preservation planning uh, matters. And joining me today are Carly, and I think also Jill is here. But would you like to introduce yourselves? Sure, Carly, do you wanna go first? Sure thing, yes, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Judy also sends her regards. My name is Carly Vendetti, and I am a community planner with the Barrett Planning Group. Um, I will be leading a good portion of the engagement through this process, and I'm just really excited to get started. Hi, I'm Jill Slankus. Um, I'm an environmental planner with the Barrett Planning Group, um, and I will be working on um, this project um, in any way that it's a fit, particularly with looking at natural resources and how they apply to the historic preservation plan for that area. Right. Well, uh, Ju and Judy uh, Barrett sends her regrets. She had a previously scheduled meeting for uh, this evening, but we wanted to touch base with the commission as soon as possible and not wait until your uh, June meeting because some of the earliest drafts of the uh, sections of the preservation plan are actually gonna be due to the city um, by June 30th. Uh, so we were hoping to hear your thoughts just very informally um, on how well the existing historic properties inventory is supporting your work as a commission. Um, we thank Sarah for relaying our, our questions to you ahead of time to give you a chance to think about them. And we're really hoping to come away from this just brief discussion with literally a laundry list of uh, concerns, uh, questions you might have, things you'd like to see the preservation plan address, and really things that we should be keeping in mind in the next few weeks as we do the analysis of the existing inventory and existing historic designations. So I guess uh, my first question is, uh, <laughs> how well do you feel the city's historic properties inventory is supporting uh, the commission's work? And uh, where would you like to see things clarified or, or improved in some way? Does anyone want to lead off on that? Steve. Um, I have a few thoughts that I wanted to share. Um, first, I think that, and sorry for the light here, it's sort of like uh, Zoom fun in the dark. Um, but I think that the inventory is both um, too much and too little. And that this is a common problem that we find in um, cities and towns across Massachusetts and communities across the country um, in that we have a lot of survey data. Um, but surveys are useful as background information for planning, but don't provide protection. So we have too little um, number of properties which are designated uh, in any way at the local level. And I think this is confusing for the public, not just in Northampton, but um, but all around. And so that I looked it up today, there's, and I'm sure you know this number too, having recently looked at the background information, it's 1,716 entries in the MACRIS database. Um, so what do we do with that? I mean, it's sort of unwieldy, uh, you know, um, and uh, it's there. It's good. I'm glad it's there. It's useful. But I think um, that the question of how do we think about what should be locally designated? How does the inventory work with designation programs? How do we talk about um, what preserves places? Um, and then how do we communicate that to the public are really central issues for the planning process. Great, thank you. Anybody else? 
Oh, I'll, I'll go. Um, so I work at the Forbes Library in addition to serving on the Historic Commission in local history and in reference. And we get questions on a weekly basis, at least um, on people's house history. So there's a lot of work around the historic form bees at, at Forbes. Um, it's People are often surprised that their house, despite its age, is not represented in the, in the Form B inventories. Um, and it's more prevalent outside of the sort of main Elm Street, downtown, you know, historically more reputable neighborhoods. Um, I think there could be rep more representation outside of those areas. I think we've, we've gotten better um, with the last group. Oh, the last work that we did to expand it, but I still think there's a lot of work to be done, particularly in outlying areas in, you know, neighborhoods like Island Road or in Florence and Leeds. There's a, there's just a lot of neighborhoods that are not represented in the collection in the way that they should be. Um, right. uh, generally, people are really excited when they do find that their house is represented on it. I think in all my years of working with folks, I've only had one person who was upset <laughs> uh, that there was a form B because they didn't ask for it and they right. didn't know how it could have possibly been done. Um, right. But, you know, the work that's been d done is good. It's, uh, there's always, you know, details and improvements and little, you know, clarifications to be done on the records that have been done. Um, I'm excited to have more done, but it, it does, you know, we have the physical binders of the form Bs in our in our local history room. And it's it's a very large collection. I, I really hear what Stephen's saying. It can, it can seem very unwieldy the way it is, um, but there certainly are a lot of things still not represented. Right. And you mentioned the uh, MHC's MACRIS database, the Massachusetts Cultural Resource Information System. They also include uh, different areas of the city that really are coming off of USGS topo maps. Um, but they mentioned those uh, parts of town, different villages, um, for the purpose of being able to run reports that are on historic resources that are specific to a, a certain village or a certain part of town. And I just wanted to run by you. Um, the uh, list that they have currently is uh, Bay State, Florence, Laurel Park, Leeds, Northampton, which they use to convey the greater downtown area, Pine Grove and West Farms. Um, those are sort of the big areas of settlement historically. And in addition to Island Road, are there others that you think merit inclusion in, in just that ability to be able to uh, identify historic resources and run reports and run uh, lists of important buildings? Well, well, Island Road is sort of the beginning of a stretch of homes near the meadows, which goes through the whole Holly Street, Pomeroy Terrace neighborhood, then to Fair Street and all of those, you know, that go directly down into the meadows, and then even Riverbank Road, uh, some of the North Street neighborhoods. I'm, I'm not sure where the division of what is Northampton is, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and when we... In our historical research that we've done in the last few years, we're finding more and more evidence of early um, Black history in Northampton around Dates and North Streets and even up into the Laurel Park area, um, but not quite reaching Laurel Park. So I, I do think there's a lot of you know, research to be done in those, in those mm -hmm. major particular mm -hmm. And there definitely is also a gap with some of the newer buildings uh, because the the current or updated inventory was was based primarily on what was done in the 70s and built off of that. Um, right. You know, things that weren't considered historic in the in the 70s, but certainly are now, were not included at that point. Right. And actually, one of the reasons that we mentioned recent past as being up to circa 1975 is because. That's where we are, believe it or not, in terms of kind of you've heard of uh, not in my backyard, this is not in my lifetime, right? But uh, we're up to, for planning, per preservation planning purposes, we're up to looking at historic resources that were in place up to circa 1975. So uh, we did notice that um, 
there were some new inventory forms that were added back in 2010, 2011 that covered some of the post-World War II uh, buildings within the existing Elm Street uh, district. And that must have been done you know, for design review. Um, but any other, any other areas of town or, or certain historic resources that you'd like us to keep an eye out for? Yes. Okay, from the talk monthly. Okay, the uh, talking about other areas of town. You guys are from Eastern Mass. There's an interesting oddity here in this locale that you may not have discovered yet. There were a couple of itinerant photographers in the 1880s who went around to places and knocked on doors and said, "We're photographers. We're the House Brothers," and they took. I think over 15,000 photos of whoever answered the door, which would typically be the mother with a couple of kids and the dog. And so that archive, it lives at the uh, Asheville Historic Society and the University of Massachusetts Amherst has scanned the entire collection. Huh. It is all Western Mass. I don't think too much into Berkshire County, but mostly Northern Connecticut and maybe into Berkshire County, but. It's a resource you probably didn't know of. And it's somewhat integrated into the overall scheme of form Bs, but not probably formally. Um, no, Craig, Craig, if I can interrupt you, okay. Craig, if I can interrupt once again about the House Brothers collection, there's also some of that at Historic Northampton. That's true. A lot of that's online. A lot of that's online too, as well as in the collections. That's and also, Craig, 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 your sound is, is really bad tonight. You usually have very good sound. Is there, you can't change to a different microphone or something? Nope, I don't have my microphone here. It's at my office. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, we can, I can still hear you. Okay. I just wanted to mention that there's common, everyone in Massachusetts knows there's 351 cities and towns, mm -hmm. but there's actually over 1,400 villages that are unincorporated. That database lives on the Secretary of State's, if you type into their search panel, archaic names, they will all pop up. And it's very interesting. There's four, there's four traditional villages in Northampton. There's Northampton, Florence, Leeds, and Bay State Village, which is kind of recovering its lost persona, but it's also undergoing a loss of its historicness underway right now. Right. Um, a lot of modest worker grade housing, 12 to 1400 foot farmhouse style vernacular housing uh, is being demoed. And the developer there knows the game, comes with a proposal, we drop the demo delay on it, they time us out, and then the little house gets torn away and three two or three houses get built on the same lot of 2,500, not big 5,000 foot houses we'll see in Eastern Mass, but nonetheless out of character and the neighborhood is undergoing great angst. And so I think a focus would have to be on how to mitigate that, how to include, I told them early on that they had to start doing Form B researches on this stuff and nobody really stepped up. And there's great holes in the neighborhood down there and great angst too. So I think that should be on your uh, radar screen because there will be people talking about this. Excellent. And, and also uh, uh, that reminds me with your, the administration of your demolition delay bylaw um, up until a certain time period, is it 1900? You, you also review um, ancillary buildings on a property, carriage houses, barns, that sort of, am I, am I correct about that? And then from 1900 to 1940, you review simply the principal building on the, on the property? Uh, I believe it's 1945, but okay. yes. 45. Um, do you find that the inventory that you're just sort of at a loss for getting those uh, any kind of documentation on those uh, historic secondary buildings? Because traditionally, over time, you know, 
the focus has been the main building on a lot, but uh, are you finding yourselves as a commission uh, at a disadvantage in your review if, uh, if you're lacking the documentation of the outbuildings as well? Well, we recently had an incident um, where a developer had purchased a property and tore down, uh, do you remember this? The, it was an old barn, um, right? It was one of the in-town barns, very mm -hmm. small. Um, the contractor, I guess, wasn't aware. And uh, anyway, um, we, you know, acted on that, I guess I would say. But um, I would say that that's true. I think that there are a lot of um, buildings that we probably don't know about and we are losing um, our in-town ancillary structures. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great concern. Um, I would just add a couple items as well. Um, the neighborhood, I don't know what you call it. So the neighborhood um, that would be on the east side of uh, Round Hill, so down by State Street. Um, that's actually where this barn was torn down. Um, oh. I think that's an underdocumented area, and okay. there are a lot of a lot of historic, sort of small vernacular um, buildings there. And I also um, related to your comment, Kathy, about the uh, you know post-war. Um, you know, we have subdivisions that were built post-war. Um, the Ryan right. Road area, um, Cloverdale is another neighborhood, and um, that's where the former nursing home is getting rehabbed. And I don't think those neighborhoods are documented. Um, and then the other thing is that you bring up in um, your question two um, that we're looking at, important themes. And I do think that we have some very strong historic themes in Northampton. It would, it would be, I think, important um, for preservation in the long term to try to link properties that relate to those th mm -hmm. themes somehow in the inventory. So I'm thinking, mm -hmm. um, well, the North Street area, um, there's a very strong Polish tradition there. Um, right. You know, with the Polish church that is um, in the process of being redeveloped, possibly. Um, we have a history of social service in this community with the Northampton State Hospital and then mm -hmm. just all of the activities that um, have stemmed from that. Um, we have a long LGBT uh, tradition mm -hmm. um, that continues. Um, and there are many structures in the town that are associated with that. So I think um, this is something I'd like to work with you on um, just to identify what those are and make sure that we're including, you know, things that you maybe wouldn't identify as being historically so significant, but they have some really strong historic or social connection. Great. And actually, one of the, um, one of the many benefits of seeing how historic property research has evolved in the last 20 years, especially, but it's accelerating even in the last 10 years since the last time uh, Northampton updated its, its survey, is now that we have so much information online, especially census records and you know all kinds of uh, um, naturalization records, and we can see you know what country people came from, and we can see who was living with whom in their household. That has just opened up so many possibilities for uh, just sort of social history and and just that personal level research that didn't exist, or just wasn't possible back in the 70s when the, the city first did its, its inventory. And uh, to be able to kind of address that as something that, that you all can you know, have on record as being a priority when you get back to, to doing more survey, I think would be, would be useful because the information is just fabulous and and you're correct you know a lot of it is not in the existing inventory today because most of it predates when this information became so accessible to to everyone researching yeah so it's pretty exciting yeah if i could just I say something. That. oh go ahead Barbara. oh okay it's sorry um i just want to say something that that relates a bit to what um craig was saying about some neighborhoods which are 
really feel threatened and feel like they're losing their character because some older houses are being torn down. I'm also on the board of Historic Northampton, which is a private um, uh, museum and education uh, organization. And we, were, we um, have been getting requests recently from people in certain neighborhoods in Northampton saying, you know, can you help us or what, what can we do about either researching or um, helping to keep our, our neighborhood character, character. And so we are currently redoing our um, website and initiating some other projects. And I think we are planning to do outreach for research and contributions for information from various neighborhoods, um, which I think could be either referenced in the historic preservation plan or at least um, in a list of resources for that. And um, I think we could also suggest that people could um, submit a form B or suggest a form B for a house or um, other structures. Is it my, it's my understanding, I seem to recall that anybody can submit a form B as Absolutely. long as it's documented, right? So that Absolutely. people could, could fill out a form B and then see if it's accepted. And, Right. So I, I think that's something that we're really trying to do because as Craig said, a lot of people feel that with the um, current um, city, I don't know if we want to call it attitude or zoning that, that seems to be encouraging infill and is resulting in changing the character of some of these neighborhoods um, that we really want to try and get the information from the people living there. And again, this might be going towards identifying potential historic districts too, because Pomeroy Terrace, um, I, I can't remember, yeah, that nomination, it's, but that's a national historic district, is it not? And then there's an application in for um, parts of Florence to be an African-American historic district. And I know that's different from local historic districts, but it's still, we're hoping to really be able to identify more of these, again, the themes in various neighborhoods and how we might protect them. Yes, frozen. Okay. <laughs> While Barb is on freezing, does anybody else have other comments, Harvey or Steve? Oh yeah, I had something else. Um, I think this is a great question to for us to think about, and especially for landscape. I know um, one of the consultants mentioned natural resources earlier, which we might think of in a whole variety of ways and in terms of Oh, we just got a little bit. Of, I got a little bit of Barbara there. Are you back, Barbara? Sorry, I hold you a thought. I, I think I'm here, but everybody else just froze for me. I don't know okay. if you can hear me now. We can hear you, yeah. Okay, sorry. I don't know. You what want to happened. continue your thought? Um, well, I don't know what how much you heard, but it's just you know again trying to get the information from the neighborhoods, encourage them to submit form Bs, so that we can try and identify the themes in neighborhoods and figure out how we might be able to um, preserve things and somehow work with the current zoning. And it, it, seems, it. it seems as though uh, uh, while ultimately uh, inventory forms, especially if they're produced on a, a significant scale um, coming from a municipality, they tend to be uh, produced by consultants when they're submitted to the Mass Historical Commission but there definitely are plenty of opportunities for using that format to sort of collect information from people about their own houses. And, and once you have that sort of critical mass for a neighborhood, then you know, a consultant can hit the ground running and look into a lot of those details further. And basically a, a lot of this is um, packaging you know, packaging the information in such a way that it will be accepted um, at the Mass Historical Commission in Boston and then ultimately available online. So, but uh, starting with, with folks who want to see their properties included and their history, their family histories included is, is really the first step. And a, a great uh, public uh, information uh, tool for helping to uh, sort of promote the excitement of, of preserving one's house or one's neighborhood. Yeah, that also can be a great um, uh, uh, teaching opportunity in public schools, you know, for kids uh, 
young, I mean, a, a lot of ages, I think, to take that on to research their family's home, even if it's newish, it's post-war. Um, it gives them interest in their community and also research skills. And so, um, Steve, you need to finish your thought about natural resources. Uh, yeah, so, and about geographies. I mean, I think it, it connects to the question of how people find information. So um, how we think about those territories, um, neighborhood names, historic names versus maybe how people call places today or how they understand their own neighborhood. That might be ward number or zip code or other things. Um, I think if we're serious about landscape and we're serious about um, agricultural history or a wider variety of resources, that it would be useful to at least start or make some recommendations about covering the entire territory of the town so that those boundaries um, could uh, at least raise the question of, can we get a good survey of um, what's going on? So when I was talking earlier, I didn't mean to say that survey is not important. I think survey is really important, but we have um, limited resources in this project and it, it's starting to seem like quite a quick timeline too. So I think um, that could be an excellent recommendation, right? To think about what are the existing categories and then what, what other ones would we need to have full, full coverage? And I think with GIS and with a lot of the tools that we have today, we could actually do that pretty simply and then at least set out a, a, a plan of work for um, future research. Mm -hmm. I also think um, some inventory recommendations that have to do with queer history and understudied themes and um, mid-century modern architecture, vernacular architecture, ranch houses, there's a whole series of things which you know, if we think about those survey forms, um, not only is it early in preservation history and at the very beginnings of preservation planning, if you're looking at a form from 76, 77, 78, um, but also 20, you know, 50 years earlier as a benchmark at that time is houses from the 20s. So we really have, you know, decades and decades and decades. So we have a situation where we have a lot of territory, a small population, no permanent advocacy group, two different commissions that review historic resources, a lot of stuff on the inventory, but a lot of things that are missing, you know, so there's just, there's a lot of, um, I think, connections that need to be made. Mm -hmm. um, and your expertise in seeing how other cities have put that together to help the commission, but also to help the public right. be able to access that information, especially for resources that are unsurveyed, right? Mm -hmm. How can we how can we work with that? And I'm intrigued by your idea of the sort of citizen capacity of raising an almost form B or a not quite submitted form B. Um, but yeah, I think the coverage is a really important issue. And I think those territories, you know, if I don't think the public process allows for this, but it would be an interesting question to ask how people think about different parts of the city. If you created eight areas, would that would that work or is word, word, word boundary sustainable or is that not something that people think about? But I do think we need to really ask the question about even resources that are within conservation land areas or that are um, you know, uh, natural resources, landscapes in one way or another. So anyway, I have a zillion more thoughts, but I'll stop there. <laughs> so Kathy, I just wanted to mention too that um, uh, I've been working with your survey master plan that you did with Ar for Arlington. Uh -huh. And that was a great exercise. And I think that's something to think about is there maybe a, perhaps a recommendation of this plan um, okay. that that be just, you know, think about it. You know more about it than I do. Um, but we have a very supportive um, community preservation committee um, that, you know, has been very good about um, supporting historic preservation efforts. So there's funding available and it's it's just something that I think to look at. Great. Does anybody have other comments? Harvey, you've been quiet. Anything to add? Y'all are doing great. <laughs> okay. I'll add in something somebody mentioned State Street. Really, the oddity about State Street that used to be the right of way of a canal that connected New Haven, Connecticut, with North Hampton. And there are actually 
older houses on State Street that used to be waterfront property as the canal went right past their house. Okay, good. Yeah, and I, I think that's another excellent example of a theme, you know, that's cross-cutting, right? So we think about infrastructure as a theme, right? We, we have a lot of information, I think, about railroad histories. We're learning more about that canal history, but we might think about other, especially if we think of infrastructure as landscape, which is common now today, right? That we, we might use that as a theme. Also, there may be other resources in that, that way of thinking. Yeah, it's a great. Right. And, and that's an important, uh, important evolution in a city's historic properties inventory, especially as preservation planning has, has developed since the 1970s, is that it's not just historic buildings. Um, you know, it's the infrastructure, the canal system, a, a railroad right of way, and how do those places actually, or those resources actually connect and define different groups in the community. Um, so, and uh, you had also mentioned uh, conservation areas. Those are great candidates for historic properties inventory forms because they're typically a, a readily defined area, um, which is key uh, to, to submit a form to Mass Historical Commission. We have to be able to show precisely where it is on a map and what the extent of it is. Um, so it, these are wonderful ideas. Thank you. Yeah, and I would also just, um, this is maybe more for Carly and um, your group at Barrett. Um, I think it's gonna be really important for the public to weigh in on this. And, you know, if we could effectively reach out to the public to gauge what um, people in this community think is important about Northampton history. Because we do have a diverse community in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that's an important piece of this, so. Yes, of course, and we definitely agree. We wanted to look more out towards the end of summertime as well as fall when we're looking yeah, at definitely, engagement. Definitely. Um, just for the timeline, because we knew that a few people in your community may leave for the summertime, um, look to escape different parts, and we wanted to be able to capture everyone in the process. Yeah, no, that's smart. Public engagement in the summer is a disaster, <laughs> basically. But if you do have any events coming up in the fall that you would love us to be present at or you think would be a large part of the community and draw a lot of folks, um, we would love to maybe look at those as opportunities to be there as well. Okay, well, we'll all think about that. Yeah. I think farmer's markets is one thing that comes to mind right away. You know, there's, there's existing public gatherings, right? I think you have tabling in your proposal or, you know, just some sort of informal face-to-face -face would be great. Yes, and I think we'd be at the Saturday session for those, and those are eight to one, correct? Um, there, I, we have like three or four different <laughs> things happening. Yeah. There's a Tuesday, there's a Tuesday market and, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not even sure of the schedule for this summer. It's I have the right Tuesday today. one's the one that comes to mind right away, but there's a Saturday market, right, by the courthouse? Uh, yes, and then there's, I think Florence has one, its own. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Excellent. yeah, anything like that, you know, let us know um, what we can do to provide resources, and together our group will put our heads um, together and figure that out for you. Sure, thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, very much for your, uh, for putting us in on your agenda on such short notice. This has been really helpful for us to, you know, be able to look at the inventory and the designations and start planning for the uh, public engagement um, component of it while, you know, having, uh, being mindful of uh, some of the concerns and the interests that are out there already. Great. Okay. Is there anything else that we can provide for you tonight? I'm sure we'll keep thinking about this. So there may be more. <laughs> I know you have a deadline though coming up, Kathy, you said, so we don't want to well, um, you know, any anything, if it's all right with Sarah, if you have any additional thoughts and are willing to um, uh, relay them to Sarah, is that all right? Um, and then she can get them to uh, Judy Barrett and uh, Carly and Jill and I, um, uh, that, that would be helpful. Um, but yes, the, uh, the 
uh, time frame where we're trying to get first drafts to you of a, a few sections of the plan at the front end, you know, what's outlined in the scope of work um, by the end of June, but those are, uh, they're not going to be set in stone. Uh, it's just our draft and then we'll go through the uh, review process and be able to tweak those and that'll happen probably over the summer. Um, so there, there is some time if, if some thoughts occur to you uh, this week, especially if you're, if you're able to just jot them down and send off an email, that'd be great. Thank you. Great. Okay. Anybody else have other questions before we lose Kathy? And uh, just, and just to clarify the timeline a little bit, Martha, the only rush on, on this segment of the plan is to take advantage of some state funding that is only available through the end of fiscal year 22. Correct. And that will allow us to maximize the CPA funding and, and yeah. focus more on Understood. additional yeah. aspects later. Okay, great. I like the way you guys think. <laughs> <laughs> I, can I just say, uh, we're really excited to get started. So we're glad you're here too. We've been thinking about this and talking about this for a couple of years. So um, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. And, and many of us uh, have a soft spot for Northampton for various reasons, which will become more clear as, as we talk further. <laughs> yeah, Kathy, we're so glad. I'm so glad you're here doing this. This is great. This is great to have you. And Thank you. We appreciate the opportunity. And uh, Judy will be with us on the on the next round, I'm quite sure. Fantastic. Wish her our best. We will. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you all. Thanks, Carly. Bye. My dog is barking, I apologize. Um, okay, that was fantastic. Um, the next on the agenda, item on the agenda is the review of the proposed Underground Railroad Historic Signage. If there was a um, package in our materials for the meeting. And um, if you all had a chance to go through this, uh, there's a proposal to place interpretive signage on Meadow Street. And I believe the, um, Sarah said in her report, um, we need to sign off on this um, or support it, I guess I should say. Do, so do we need to actually take a vote on it or do we just need to uh, endorse? Uh, so DPW has requested the Historic Commission's input as a matter of policy for these types of signage proposals. And there, there's actually someone here to give a little overview and, and answer any questions. Oh, perfect, okay. Is that Sosa? Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Welcome. Hi. Hi. My name is Sosa Simon. I'm a Smith College alumni, but I'm also a, uh, I recently received my master's degree in architecture this year recently. Um, so I'm here to propose a plaque that will be installed on Metal Street on a public land that will be right next to the recognitions um, since they're near the ballpark and also right across from the uh, Northampton uh, grow food um, organization. And so the idea of this plaque is to recognize the history of the Underground Railroad in Northampton and to recognize the contribution that Florence had um, with African-American history and to give the general public information and knowledge about how much this history was important and understand the complexities of how, and what was interesting about Florence and comparing it to other places where Florence was more open, open in terms of allowing African-Americans to own property, own land and have a sense of humanity um, for a brief period of time during a time period of slavery. So it's an opportunity to give the general public awareness about this history. Great, thank you. Do people have um, comments or questions? Dylan. Um, just to say, I think this, this is wonderful. I think the, the location of it is really great because it will get a lot of public exposure via the athletic fields and things and its location right next to the Ross Farm is, is crucial for the history. So um, I'm excited, I think the, the the text looks great to me. Um, yeah, it seems to fit stylistically with our other signage in the, in the city. So, fully support. Yeah, it really looks great and um, you know really well documented for us and you know reminding us of 
of all the history and then showing us what it's going to look like and where it's going to be. It's just, it's great. I, I would really endorse it. Anybody else? I just had a um, quick question. First, uh, Asosa, congratulations on your architecture degree. We Thank met you. several years ago at Smith. It's nice to see you again. Yeah, you too. Uh, and I think one of the first times we met, we talked about this this uh, this site. Um, but I'm curious, uh, sort of how the project came together. Could you tell us a little bit more about, um, was this based on your research and then you came to DPW or working with Historic Northampton or how, how did it come together? It actually came together um, based off of a, um, when I was a senior at Smith College, um, I remember I remember you as well. Um, when I proposed um, the uh, a project pertaining to the Underground Railroad in Northampton, but it kind of evolved into a signage, and then eventually I worked with the David Ruggles Center documenting African Americans and fugitive slaves that lived in Northampton at that time. And I also got an opportunity to research more about Sojourner Truth as well, and that kind of led to me wanting to create this signage project as well. So it was actually based off of my experience being at Smith. That's great. That's great. That's like really exciting. Yeah, I think it, I think it's excellent. It's it's excellent to have more interpretation in that more interpretation of this history um, for visitors and for residents, and and more interpretation in that particular location too. So I'm uh, strongly in favor. Other comments? I'm hoping it's just that this sets a precedent and we can have more um, interpretation associated with a new National Register District that's being formed in that area. Um, you know, particularly around the Park Street, um, Park Street air neighborhood. Um, so this is a great uh, way to kind of get that going and appreciate, appreciate it very much. Oh, yeah. So will we, uh, any other comments? Um, do we want to uh, endorse this uh, full support for this project so DPW gets that message? And what's the best way to do that, Sarah? Should we just, um, we don't need to vote. Uh, a vote would be great. So someone could oh. move to uh, support the, the proposed signage and also to uh, co-sponsor the council order to accept the gift. Uh, I'll make the motion. I move to accept the proposed signage and to um, do whatever Sarah said was the second part of the motion related to a council agreement, something. I should have written it down, sorry. Just I had too much excitement and not enough attention to detail. Anyway, the motion as Sarah articulated it. I would second that. Any more comment? Okay, I think we can take a vote. All right, uh, Barbara? Yes. Craig? Yes. Steve? Yes. Dylan? Yes. Martha? Yes. Ann Harvey? Yes, yes. Right. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for coming, Sosa. Are you, you're you. Not in, are you in the area or are you very remote? I'm remote right now, but I am coming back um, to Northampton soon. Great. Well, welcome thank you back. Thank you. <laughs> Nice to see you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the next item is the approval of administrative bylaws and rules of procedure. So I, I was reminded after I published the agenda that this actually requires a public hearing. So this is more of an information item at that point. We would want to do that at the next meeting, would we, Sarah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, do we want a little bit more time to review these, anybody? Before the public meeting, does anybody have any dis questions or discussion they would like to have related to this at this time? I have one small question. Mm -hmm. Under 1.6, number eight, uh, any documents that are presented to a board must be provided to board staff in paper and electronic form to be part of the public record. Is that actually done in practice anymore? Uh, not really. It, it was actually prior to COVID, but since right. then, it's not been. I don't know if anyone actually caught that to them, but I, uh, I figured. Let me, let me uh, elaborate on what is required to be provided in paper for state law and then make it clear that not everything needs to be. Right. Okay, thanks. 
Any other comments or questions? So we'll take this up at the next meeting. We want to just hold on to this and um, be familiar with it. And then we would have the public hearing at the beginning of the meeting, which probably no one will attend, right? I, yeah. I wouldn't anticipate a lot of comment on this. Um, are there any other items that anyone would like to discuss? I have a question about this. It was, I think it was one of the attachments you sent us, Sarah, this letter to Wayne from uh, Rona Simon. Yes. About a, 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 a Gabion wall, which I meant to look up what a Gabion wall is, but I never got to that. Wait, in, I, I in, like to call them rocks and cages. So there, it's the wire frame. Oh, with, okay. With the rocks. Rocks. But, but rocks this, I couldn't tell from that letter where this is. It, it really didn't give a location. So if it you go under, this. if you're in the roundhouse parking lot, you go underneath the South Street Bridge, it's the wall on your right. Uh, in between, oh. you know, there's a there's a very it's large, already there. Very tall there's floor already floor. Yeah. One of, so there's already one of these things there. Yes. So that that's the one it's referencing. So on the bike path. So they're gonna yes. they're gonna construct more of it or. Uh, so it's a structural hazard. Um, at some point, it is absolutely going to fall into the bike path, and the, right. That's that why they necessitate this. some significant repair. So the background on right. on this is that the city got a, a grant to repair the wall. Um, right. But as part of the review process for the grant funds, we needed to prepare a, a form F. Uh, so like a form B for buildings, but form F for right. other, other things to ensure that there was no unanticipated impacts mm -hmm. to historic resources. Right, right. So, so is it good historic said, no, there, there's not. This isn't this is not an important historic resource. Right. You can go ahead. But is it going to remain a, a stone wall with um, the metal netting or it's going to be something different? Uh, so something will be constructed in between the wall that's there now and, and the bike path, just to make it structurally stable. So they keep the gabions, is that? Yeah. yeah. That, and it's be been really un over that could be potentially extremely unattractive. <laughs> it's pretty unattractive. Or, or weird, I know, but pretty weird to have a wall and then another wall. Okay. And so part, the historic parts of the wall uh, will are really not visible and they're, they'll remain. Uh -huh. Um, right, but okay. what's there will be modified in some way. I don't know if there's a okay. design. And is it, point, is it just planned? The goal is to make it structurally stable. Right, but it's just planned for the part that currently has what you're calling the Gabion wall. Yes. It's, it's, yeah, so it's kind of behind the Smith parking lot, I think is where is. that is. Yeah. So it's yeah. a it's a mix of materials. Currently. Right, right. It's, okay. It's some older right. stones. It's some. I, I thought that might be it, but I just wasn't sure because it didn't really give a location. Okay, that's all I needed to know. Thank you. So you need to go down there, Barbara, and take a look at the gabions and. No, no I've seen it. I pass by there all the time, there but I go. didn't know what that was called, and I didn't realize <laughs> that that was where the repair was going to be. Okay. And uh, only else? other update for me, I think, is that the, the Clark School was uh, accepted for national register listing by the Park Service. Great. Fantastic. That took a long time. It did, yes. <laughs> and that, that was the end of the ta tax credit process? It was, yeah. yeah. I, I have one question if we have just a few minutes. I think it was at our last meeting, someone mentioned, was kind of reeling off addresses and talking about historic change and the town and stuff like that. I was, um, and it seemed like the comment was a little bit about what triggers review. Um, and then mixed into that conversation was um, deconstruction as opposed to demolition. Um, does this, does everyone, yeah, there's Craig. Craig, maybe yeah. some more. Um, so I just wondering if there are some cases that maybe don't meet the threshold for historical commission, but that kind of raise historical issues, or maybe Sarah, what your take was on how that might relate to what we hear versus what staff can decide doesn't meet the you know criteria for coming to historical commission. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, so you're referring to the demolition review ordinance, Steve. I think so. I mean, it was a okay. little hard to tell from the person's 
um, comments, but, and she seemed concerned about deconstruction, maybe not falling under demolition review, or maybe it was the age of the resource. I'm not sure exactly, but yeah, it so seemed like there's I, some, some I, general I, rumblings around town of like what's happening and, and when does it go to historical commission? I, I think what that may have been referring to was a, a recent case where um, it, some work needed to be done to a building prior to complete demolition. Um, and the, the only thing that triggers demolition review under the ordinance currently is a, a permit filed with the building department that proposes full and complete demolition. So anything short of that, you know, taking down 95% of a building and leaving one structural wall um, wouldn't come to the Historical Commission. Um, you know, slowly taking away parts of a building wouldn't come to the Historic Commission until something gets filed with the building department. So only properties within the local historic district get review for um, significant <laughs> adverse modification or, you know, yeah. something like that. Okay. So that Sarah, was the, also the case with that property, I don't remember the location and I actually don't think I attended the meeting. It was a property that, um, I think it was an old like dairy barn or something like that, or part of a, um, I don't know. Do you remember this? It was some kind of a, uh, a utilitarian building, but it had a, it was historic, and the owners were taking it apart, and they were going to kind of rebuild part of it. Do you remember this? Yeah. So this at 20, 23 Hooker Ave. Yeah. Um, that's it. So yeah. that that was a case where you know the an oil tank needed to be taken out, and some other work was done prior to the contractor actually needing to file a permit for demolition. Uh, so that did not come to the historic commission subcommittee until that permit application was filed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because I had said something to you, Sarah, about that, that it was, you know, I went to take a look at it and there was essentially it was the outer walls were there and it's as if a lot of the demolition had already happened. So it just seemed very odd to me the way that law works. Um, you know, what am I going to say? It's, it, it just, it, it puts us in a, really at a disadvantage, to say the least, we can't judge it because it's not there. And yet they didn't do anything illegal. Uh, and, uh, but I think it, that was an extremely strange circumstance where practically everything was gone before they had to apply a, um, for a demolition permit to just knock down the rest of the walls. Yeah, and that, that's certainly been unusual. I don't recall a case where that's ever happened yeah. before. Um, and it's the structure of the demolition ordinance is intentionally meant to remove discretion by the part of the building commissioner so that you know, when they get an application, it just does this proposed demolition, yes or no. Um, so that that way an, an applicant never needs to appeal that part of the decision. You know, it's it's clear it's either demolition or it's not um, there's so actually a, th this was a this was a unique case there's a there's a really notable one that happened i think it was on union street probably eight-ish years ago there was a house that we actually gave a historic preservation award to that was sold to a new owner and they tore down most of it without even knowing and, and they, uh, because they didn't demo it all. Mm -hmm. so they, the, the building commissioner green lighted the demolition that did take place without us even knowing. So, first holes in our, our little demo log. But, I think this would be a really interesting question to ask the consultants, you know, what other cities and towns do? And is there a, a legal phrasing that says substantial? you know, um, or majority or 51% um, or 75%. I'm sure that others with 351 different cities and towns, I'm sure there's gotta be other um, legally acceptable ways to, right. to write it. And Steve, I, I seem to recall that when we did finally get our demolition review law passed, there was discussion of, you know, how do you define and do you find this partial demolition or 75% by volume or by which walls or whatever? And one of, the one of the many compromises we had to make to get that law to pass 
was that it would be total demolition only. You know, and it's, well, we weren't happy with it, but that's one of the, as I said, one of the compromises we had to make. Yeah, and, and part of the reason for that is because generally the, um, you, you would appeal a decision to the building commissioner, but you can't appeal the building commissioner's decision to the building commissioner. So then it, you might get, even before the, the demo review really starts, an applicant might be looking at a case where they're, they don't agree and then looking at a potential court situation. So that was what was tried to be avoided at that point. Um, I seem to recall like the communities do do it differently, but there were a lot of yeah. local concerns and not wanting to put too much of a burden on applicants who, who weren't conducting a full demo. Right. Yeah, I, think, I mean, I think, I, think if, uh, I was just going to say, I think if that's the case and that survey information or this commission doesn't get a chance to weigh in, the way to deal with that is through designation, um, it, either having the ability to designate individual landmarks or thinking about more yeah. local historic districts. That's where that's where protection comes from. And if protection is mm -hmm. not an ordinance and there's reasons not to do it, then I think we need to think about how how you might go about those other approaches but if the question is more community character and it seems like there's a lot of kind of community character questions like maybe historic maybe not historic or the historic character of a whole area i think that's a much trickier one to tackle i think but also anyway, I'm, thank you for having this i didn't realize that's the way that ordinance was written and that was the power of the building commissioner to do that so i thank you for these comments I, really helpful i also because I seem to recall the building inspector at the time just didn't want to have to make those distinctions or decisions on, well, is it half, is it three quarters? What if they leave, you know, the facade up? It, it just, so again, we, it was one of the things we had to give up. I mean, I think we also have to look at ways of um, creative incent creating incentives to retain historic fabric, um, you know, some sort of reward is too strong a word, but some type of incentive. Um, so that's, I'm hoping that the planners can do that as well. Yeah, I, I think these are all really excellent questions and topics of discussion for the preservation plan. Yeah, okay, great. Good, um, it's about quarter of seven. Anybody else have any other thoughts for tonight? We are gonna meet again on the 23rd, uh, 27th. Of we are meeting on the 27th of June. Um, I actually will not be here, but so Barbara, you'll have to take command. Okay, somehow that date sounds, but I'll I'll check my calendar. Okay. To make, to make sure I'm going to be here, but I don't have it in front of me. But I'll let you know, or I'll let Sarah know. Okay, and if other people are going to be away and we want to reschedule, we should do that. But I don't know if other people are. Actually, if you wait one second, I'll walk over to my calendar. Okay. Does the 27th work for other people? The moment it does, although our summer plans are not, not set for us. Okay. Yeah, in, in, in past years, the commission has skipped summer meetings, especially when there wasn't a lot going on, or if we want to continue preservation planning activities, um, we could re certainly reschedule that so that more people can attend. Yeah, I'm going to be out of town on that day too. Okay. Do we want to try to meet the previous week? Um, the four, the fall, the next Monday is July fourth, I believe. So, the June twentieth would be the, the previous. Yeah, June twentieth. So pr about a month from now. Twentieth would be a better day for me. I would, I would miss the twentieth because I'm going to be in DC. But probably Craig. Craig, will you still be with us at that point? Yeah, that'll be my last meeting. Okay. As far as I know, that works for me. Okay. Um, so, sir, do you want to check with Jonathan, see if he's going to, he may not know, but hopefully he'll be up for it by then. And then Craig, we, or Dylan, we would just miss you, but always miss you when you're not here. <laughs> okay. So you'll send around a message, Sarah. Yes. We'll All right. Okay. Well, with that, um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn at 6.46. Harvey, seconded. Second. Okay, Barbara, and we'll. I'll just. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> nice to see you Thank all. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night, everybody. Bye, Have everyone. a good Memorial Day. Have a good night.
Good night. Bye.